Okay, we are very pleased to have Dr. Huang Hui Lan to give a one word mind seminar today. Dr. Lan is an A. Russell uh, Chandler III professor in the H. Milton Stewart School, School of Industrial and Systems, Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. Before that, Dr. Lan was on the faculty of the Department of Industrial and the System Engineering at the University of Florida from 2009 and 2015. And he obtained his PhD degree from Georgia Tech in August uh, 2009. His main research interests lie in optimization and machine learning. He has received many, many academic honors uh, he, for example, he received include, uh, include the Inverse Computing Society Prize in 2020, 2022, the Mathematical Optimization Society Tucker Prize finalist in 2012, Inverse Junior Faculty Interest Group Paper Competition First Place on 2012, and the National uh, Science Foundation Career Award on 2013. Dr. Lan served as an associate associate editor for mathematical programming, some journal on optimization and uh, computational optimization and applications. He is also an associate director of the Center for Machine Learning at Georgia Tech. Today, he will talk about policy Miller descent for reinforcement learning. So your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lang Xiu. Um for your introduction and also for your invitation to me to give this seminar. Uh, it's very exciting to give a seminar across different institutions. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of um, some recent work from my group on uh, algorithmic designs for reinforcement learning. Um, so, let's see. okay, so, um, so this is the outline of the of the uh, seminar. I will provide some background information for stochastic dynamic programming and the Markov decision process, and I will focus on a, a class of algorithm called the policy mirror descent method. is a policy um, iteration type algorithm for MTP and reinforced learning, and we also talk about um, in the stochastic case how many number of uh, samples we need uh, in order to solve the problem. Um, so we start with a uh, general introduction for stochastic dynamic programming. Stochastic dynamic programming models the interaction between the agents and, and their environment. In order to improve the decisions that the agent is going to make through this type of interactions. So in, uh, in general language, so the agent is uh, described. Uh, the um, the the agent is um, interacting with the environment, and the status for the environment is described through the states. And the agent is going to take an action at a certain point in time, and that will change the status of the environment from st to st plus one. And meanwhile, the agent is going to pay some cost. CT plus one, okay? And this interaction happens again and again. So the goal is to, is to define the best action that the agent should take at a given state. So this uh, is called a policy, optimal policy. So I'm gonna start with some prototypical examples. Um, the so-called search and rescue mission. So in, in this mission, um, some friendly units may get lost in some environmental hazard, as you can see in this type of pictures. And then a scouting unit that is actually an agent in our language will be dispatched to rescue the lost friendly units. However, under this type of environmental hazard, the navigation of the scouting unit is difficult and uncertain. So uh, if the scouting unit decide to move to a certain direction because of some unforeseen difficulty, then the agent has to move maybe along a different, different direction. In some, 
in some cases, for example, there is adversaries, um, enemies appearing in the environment, then the agent may want to have some random moves so that uh, their moves are not predictable. And the agent need to carefully calculate the cost, the cost to maintain the navigation, the cost to, uh, you know, to save enough energy, and the cost to conquer the uh, you know, difficulty. And in the end, the um, agent may get rewarded, for example, by finding the lost units and then return to the starting point. So we can have a more idealized or simpler version of this, uh, this uh, search and rescue mission. This is called the grid world, uh, a classical example in stochastic dynamic programming. So here you see the agent is a scouting unit. Um, and the state is the position of the agent. So, and in, um, in, in, this, in, this, in this picture, we have 20 by 14 uh, possible states. So the, the grid point have different types. It can be regular or target. Target means you know, the, the, the place where the lost um, friendly unit is, the tribes or the base station. At each grid point, the agent can take actions like left, right, up, and down. Okay, as we said, because of the uncertainty, the um, actual moving direction will not be the direction that has been pre-designed. So with probability one, the agent will move along the direction that has been defined, and otherwise is going to move along a random direction. So the cost is defined for different types of um, grid points. The tribe is greater than the one for the regular and which is greater than uh, for the target point. Okay, basically in the target, you get a reward. So the cost is negative. So then a mark of decision process is a very important tool to uh, model stochastic dynamic problem problems. So in this talk, we consider a very simple MTP process. So in this process, we have a finite number of state S and a finite number of action E. And this P defines the transition model. That means at a given state, you're taking action A and the probability move to a, another state at the next time point is given by P. And C is the cost function. That means at each state you take an action, what would be the cost? Okay. And gamma is a discount factor. You know, that, that will be used in calculating the accumulative cost when you run the process on, from time one to infinity, infinite horizon. So a policy, a policy pine. Uh, in this talk, we focus on a randomized policy. That means it defines a map from a state um, to a probability distribution over the set of actions. So that, that means at the state of S, the probability of selecting a particular action at a given state. Okay, so so why do we consider randomized policy? Because as we mentioned, okay, sometimes randomized policy is preferred. Okay, um, so. Also, by using randomized policy, we are going to reduce the problem from a discrete optimization problem to a continuous optimization problem, as we will see uh, a little bit later. So uh, then for a given policy pi, we need to evaluate its um, performance. So we're going to use act action value function or Q value function. That means um, if you if you start with any state A and A, so you start from A, you take action A, and then from then on, you're going to follow the policy path. Okay, that you start from A0 equal to A, A0 equal to A, and then your A1 is pi A0, okay, and so on. Your A, um, then you're going to follow the, um, the, 
the Markov decision process. So along the way, you want to calculate the cost function. So slightly different from what, what people have talked about in literature, but we decompose the um, cost function to two. One is a C and the other, the other one is H pi. So, um, so H pi sometimes is called a recognizer. So it can be, um, a, in our case, we define this as um, a, a convex function that is, um, you know, can be described uh, as the, for example, the KL divergence. That means the difference between a, our current policy pi to the given policy pi zero, okay? So we assume that the function can be uh, convex or strongly convex, depending on whether this mu is positive or not. So in general, H pi can model the preferences or constraint sets uh, that need to be satisfied by the policy. Okay, so it gave us some freedom to model the problem. And algorithmically, sometimes it helps us to um, make the algorithm faster with this regularization terms, okay? So a related uh, value function is called state value function. So for its difference between the state value function and state action value function is um, here, you just fix a state and then you just fix state as S zero equal to S, then you're going to take an action uh, according to the policy path. And then you're going to calculate the cost along the code trajectory. Okay, there are some well-known relationships between these two value functions, and the v value function is the inner part of q times uh, the policy pi. And similarly, you can calculate the q function uh, if you know the v function. Okay. So then we can formulate the problem as finding a an optimal policy pi star so that the V value function at pi star is smaller than equal to the V value function at pi for any state S. Okay, so it turns out we can formulate this problem as a single objective optimization problem. So basically, you can take the weighted sum of the value functions over all the states. And then you minimize this objective over the simplex constraint. So in particular, if we denote, if we use the um, mu star, that means the stationary state distribution induced by the optimal policy pi star, then we can choose rho equal to mu star. Then you can define a problem like this, okay? We are going to use this notion in this talk, because it turns out using this formulation, we can simplify the analysis. Even though the formulation relies on new star, but the algorithm that we are going to show does not depend on new star, okay? So next I want to discuss, you know, some existing algorithms for um, MDP and reinforced learning. So the, the major difference between MDP and reinforced learning is that in RL, we don't necessarily assume that we know P. So what we know are the samples uh, obtained from this transition dynamics. That means given, um, given a state um, and we can, we can, given a state and action pair, we can observe what's going to happen for the next state. Okay, that's all what we know. And also there are two types of, um, environment we can deal with. One is a generative model or IID model. That means for any state action pair, you can simulate what's going to be the next state. And for Markovian model, all you know is a single trajectory that, you know, um, you cannot randomly pick up a state action pair from the trajectory to start the trajectory. Okay. So there are well-known algorithms for uh, solving IL problems, okay? One is called based on linear programming. For MDP, we know there are different types of algorithms. Linear program-based approach, 
and the value of value iteration and the policy iteration. And in the stochastic setting or in RL, there are counterparts for those three basic methodology. So for linear programming, we can, we can develop stochastic linear programming approach. However, this type of approach is not friendly to nonlinear components. For example, the regularization trends that we have seen. So it, sometimes if your state space is large, we often need to use function approximation, for example, based on, you know, based on uh, kernel-based methods or, or neural networks. And those methods are not friendly to function approximations and also is not friendly to a Markovian model. A different approach is also very popular called the stochastic, stochastic value iteration or Q learning. But similarly, this kind of algorithm is also not friendly to nonlinear components, function with approximations. Moreover, it does not generate a policy uh, along the process. It uses a behavior policy for exploration. Um, what we are going to focus on is a different class of methods called stochastic first order methods. Um, since we can formulate the problem as an optimization problem. So how about we just use gradient type method to solve the problem? It turns out these methods are friendly to nonlinear components, function approximations, and Markovian models. However, in comparison with the previous two classes of algorithms, they often converge slowly because of the long complexity, non-smoothness, and some incurrent bias for the gradient estimation for this objective function f. Um, for the deterministic case, mostly they exhibit a sublinear convergence rate, except for very special cases, before, at least before our work. For the stochastic case, it also suboptimal in terms of dependence on the accuracy emptiness. So our goal in this talk is to present a large class of algorithms called policy mirror descent that can address all these issues. So let us uh, zoom in a little bit to, to the problem we, uh, we're talking about. So we tend to solve this policy optimization problem. We minimize f subject to pi in the simplex constraint. So the first of the methods only use um, gradient information. As we will see, the gradient information corresponds to the Q function. It has many different names uh, in reinforced learning setting. For example, people talk about the policy gradient, natural policy gradient, trust region policy optimization. Uh, it turns out all these different type of algorithms are intrinsically related to the mirror descent method that was developed by Nemirovsky and Rutin in the uh, 1980s. However, in spite of a large amount of research effort, there are some significant questions for this, uh, mess, this type of methods. The first question is whether this method will exhibit linear convergence under the deterministic setting. Because as we know, uh, it, um, binary iteration, policy iteration, this classic MDB method, they all exhibit linear convergence. Now you have a gradient type of algorithm. Whether this algorithm can exhibit linear convergence or not was an open problem before uh, our work. And secondly, uh, what are the sample complexities? As we said, for in, in uh, reinforced learning, the sample complexity is very important because it tells us how much number of observations we need to have. In simulation setting, it tells us how much budget you should allocate to the simulation. So, uh, as we said, for policy gradient type methods, their sample complexity are much worse than other methods. So whether we can have better sample complexity was another important problem that we want to address. The last question is actually a byproduct from our development. We are going to see that with very little additional effort, we can handle general regularization H pi. More importantly, you know, if your H pi indeed is strongly concave, we are going to show that the sample complexity will be much less than any other existing approaches, including those model-based uh, algorithms. So there are some, uh, this, this slide, uh, we sum, in this slide, we summarize some prior research on the performance guarantees for policy gradient type algorithm. So as you can see, 
if you have exact first order information, most acquisition exhibit a sublinear convergence rate, like one with square root of t or one over t. And there are linear convergence developed recently, but only applicable for very special class of problems. And how about sample complexity? The sample complexity is order one with epsilon to the power of four, or um, in general case, or one with epsilon three for entropy regularized problems. All these, you know, um, are not matching the best known convergence result for other type of algorithms. So we are going to see how we can uh, possibly address these type of issues. So we are going to start. We look look at the problem from look at the problem from optimization perspective. So even though we know the optical function is highly non-convex. However, we can still write down the first order of magnetic conditions by computing the gradient um, of the object function. Then we can write down the magnetic conditions. So after we make some multiplications, especially if we want to take care of the uh, possible non-smoothness non of the regularization function H pi, then we can write down the uh, magnetic condition this way. So it turned out even though the object function is non convex, but the um, variation in quantity reformulation of the problem has some very nice properties. This operator q pi, the q function at the pi, satisfy a so called generalized monotonicity. So basically, as you can see, the q pi times pi minus pi star. Or suppose for now your h pi is, is zero, then it's going to be equal to one minus gamma times the v function at pi minus v function at pi star, which is greater than to zero. So this property is called a generalized monotonicity for vi. It is important for us to establish the global convergence of the algorithm we are going to develop, even though the original problem is, is non convex. Okay, so um, now, as you can see, in from this formulation, okay, I want to reduce the difference between v pi and v pi star, and I know its value equal to this inner product. So how about we design an algorithm that minimizes the left hand side of this inequality? Okay, that's indeed the, I, the motivation for the algorithm development. So then we have this bonus similar descent method. Okay, in each iteration, we are going to minimize, you know, basically the left hand side that we talk about, uh, uh, you know, in the last slide, okay, plus the di distance between, uh, you know, p and the pi k. Pi k is a previous iteration, right? So we want to, uh, so we want to minimize this uh, inner product, but we don't want to move too far away from pi k, okay? And this gives us the algorithm. Okay, they're very simple. So this problem is called the proximal Maiden subproblem. In many cases, this subproblem, argument subproblem, has explicit solutions. For example, if your h pi is equal to zero, that means you don't have regularization term, or your h pi is a, a KL divergence. Um, so we also should also be noticed that this this d right now we uh, we by default we set to the KL divergence, but it can be any fragment divergence, as we have seen often in optimization algorithms. So then, what what about the convergence rate? How fast this algorithm will converge? It turns out that for now, if you assume the your H pi exists and is strongly convex, then you can. By, by some effort, you can show that they, this algorithm converge linearly, okay? And the convergence rate is given by gamma to power of k, okay? So, I, I don't think I should, I should, you know, try to prove this result, but so I will skip this slide. But basically, you know, by a few steps, you will be able to show that this algorithm converges very fast, okay? 
So now, what if your your mu mu is equal to zero, right? You don't have regularization. So even if you don't have, have regularization, so we notice that in the previous result for the one with regularization, the convergence rate does not actually depend on mu. So it only depends on gamma. That means whether you're going to have strongly regularization or not is not that important. So a simple idea is, okay, if you don't have a strongly regularization, then you add a perturbation to it, okay? And with the perturbation goes to zero. So this is the idea of approximate polysomial descent APMD, okay? And using this idea, we will show that for general uh, MDP or IO problem, this algorithm also converge linearly with a similar convergence rate, okay? And after our work, you know, uh, a few simplification have been performed. Okay? So it turns out that even if you don't put any perturbation by using a argument, you know, like for example, um, um, this is a student from Georgia Tech and, and the Ning Xiao is a researcher in Meta. Um, and also my student Yan Li. So a few, a few groups have, been, have started the simplification of this algorithm showing that you don't have to have this perturbation, the algorithm still converge linear. Okay. So basically the PMD method is a generic framework and you can add a perturbation or you don't need to add a perturbation. You can add a perturbation either in the Q function or in the uh, sub problem. So in this work, more recent work, uh, we show that if you add a perturbation to the sub problem, but not to the Q function, then you can have some even nicer properties. So basically we show that this so-called HPMD method have, um, have super linear convergence after fixed number of iterations, okay? And this fixed number of iterations is finite, the K0 is finite, and it will depend on the instance, okay? That means it may depend on the optimal solution. However, it is dependent of the algorithm. As you can see from the pictures, you know, after you run the algorithm for a certain number of iterations, the, you know, the method converges even faster, okay? So now let us move to the stochastic case because the stochastic case is indeed the one we are, we are, we are most interested in because for deterministic case, there are already many algorithms, even simpler ones like value iteration or policy iteration can already converge linearly with the same convergence rate, right? So PMD or its variance just have uh, tried to match the linear convergence rate. But it, it is in the stochastic setting that we indeed need this new development. That's something we are going to uh, talk more now, okay? In the stochastic setting, um, we assume that, you know, in the uh, stochastic setting, we, we, don't, we don't have exact information about the value function function or the gradient information. So all we have is some stochastic estima estimators. So in the uh, IL setting, uh, we are going to assume that, you know, we have this Q pi k, k c k, and this is going to be a uh, biased estimator because there's no way we can get an unbiased estimator. So the bias is bounded by one sigma and the variance is bounded by or mean square error is bounded by sigma square. So then we just, we just replace the exact Q function by this estimation function. And the algorithm is also very simple. So then we could investigate what are the general conditions on this error, sigma square and, and one sigma to guarantee the convergence of the algorithm, okay? It turns out if, if we, decrease the error in a certain geometric rate, then the geometric convergence rate for SPMD uh, can be obtained. So our analysis heavily utilizes the separation of the bias from the mean square error. On the other hand, previous studies, they bound the bias by the mean square error. So that is part of the reason why we are able to improve the sample complexity for bonus gradient type algorithm significantly. Okay. 
So here I stated a linear convergence result, but the, it is not necessary to uh, reduce the error sigma and one sigma geometrically fast. Even if you have a bounded error, the algorithm will also exhibit a, a sublinear convergence rate. So you can have a constant variance, but the algorithm will still converge by choosing the step size eta k differently. So similarly, we can develop conditions that can guarantee the convergence of the stochastic approximate polysimilar descent method in a similar fashion. So we can specify the conditions on these two error terms, sigma and one sigma, so that we can have linear convergence rate. Again, we can have uh, sublinear convergence if we, we can only have constant variance. So now, since we already defined the conditions to guarantee the convergence of the stochastic PMD method, right? So now how about you know, we supply the algorithm with some specific um, estimator for the Q function, okay? We are gonna talk about two different settings. In the first setting, we talk about a generative model. That means we can generate multiple independent trajectories starting from any pair of state and action. So then we can define a bias estimator that is basically you take the average of the cost that you have along each trajectory. Okay, so in the summation defines the cost for each trajectory. So it's going to be a biased estimator, okay? But the bias will decrease exponentially with respect to TK, the, the length of the trajectory. And the variance will decrease sub, sublinearly with respect to MK. MK is the number of independent trajectory. So this is a very simple estimator. But with this estimator, we can tell how good the um, method that we developed is in terms of the total amount of samples we need. Here, the sample means the state action pair. Okay, so then as you can see, our method can improve substantially the existing sample complexity of policy gradient methods. If mu is positive, the strongly convex case, we get a one in the convergence rate. While well, existing method is one Empson cube, which is also only applicable to a spatial, a spatial entropy regularized problem. If mu is equal to zero, for general MDP, we get a one Empson square uh, rather than one Empson force. Okay. So this complex bound in terms of dependent Empson is not improvable. And there are some further possible improvements in high probability sense. So we can show that, you know, um, the homotopic PMD can achieve linear sample complexity after it reaches a certain accuracy level with high probability. So how about the different, a uh, more challenging Markovian setting? In that setting, you have access only to the trajectory. Okay, so in that setting, we um, need to have a different algorithm to estimate the Q function. Okay, so we are going to briefly talk about the algorithm and the, the associated complexity result. So basically, given a policy pi, right, you want to estimate the Q function. Okay, and if we assume that the policy pi induces a stationary distribution nu. And we denote you know, the diagonal matrices as m pi. So we, in this basic setting, we assume that the policy is sufficiently random. That means um, pi is a is positive. So then we can, we can write down the estimation problem or policy evaluation problem as a fixed point equation. Basically, what you, what you need is to find a root 
of this operator f pi. So basically, you want to find f pi equal to zero. Then you can find the Q function associated with the policy pi. Okay, so basically, you solve a linear system, and then you find the uh, the Q function, and the linear system is strongly monotone and it ellipses. Okay, so then what is the difficulty of solving this linear system? The difficulty is that you cannot evaluate the matrix explicitly or exactly. Okay, you cannot evaluate the um, you cannot evaluate the operator. So, however, you can have some stochastic estimation for the operator of the linear system. Okay. Um, so, given a st at st plus one at plus one, we can define a f tilde, which is a uh, unbiased estimator for the operator itself. A difficulty, another difficulty is like, even though you have a unbiased meter, but you know, it is not IID, it's not identical independent distributed estimator. So we will need to, we will need to utilize the convergence properties of the Markov process in order to um, analyze the convergence of the root finding algorithm. So a, you know, what I want to highlight here is um, how can we solve this stochastic root finding problem with strongly monotone and Lipschitz continuous operator under this Markovian setting? And also, can we show that the bias will decay faster than the expected error or mean square error, similarly to the um, multiple trajectory setting, okay? So it turns out that we will be able to do that by using a simple algorithm called conditional temporal difference algorithm. This mimics the gradient descent method. Basically, you're going to move along this stochastic operator direction at each iteration. So we are going to apply periodic uh, updates. That means once after you observed alpha state action pairs, then you make update, okay? So then um, if we apply this algorithm to estimate the Q function, then we can show that the mean square error will converge in the rate of order one over T. T is number of steps for this condition temporal difference algorithm. And the bias, the second, the second equation, the bias will converge to order one over TQ. So with this, we can show that similar complexity bound can be obtained as for the um, multiple trajectory setting or generative model setting. So as you can see, if mu is positive, then we can show that the convergence rate is also order of one over epsilon. On the other hand, this result does not exist in the literature. And actually, it turned out this one epsilon result has not been obtained even for uh, model-based method. That means you first approximate the transition probability, then you solve this as a deterministic problem. Okay. If mu is equal to zero, we get one epsilon square result, which also improves the existing result. So that you know now we can see the sample complexity of um, gradient type method can match or even outperform existing algorithm for IR. So as we mentioned a little bit earlier for this uh, temporal difference algorithm, we have assumed that the policy is sufficiently random. That means your pi is always positive. But what if your pi is zero for some SA pairs? So um, if you directly apply perturbation to the policy pi k, add a small perturbation, make it positive, this will increase some complexity by orders of magnitude. In a recent work, we developed a so-called explorative temporal difference algorithm 
uh, in this algorithm, we follow the pi k all the time, but a sample from a slightly perturbed policy. Then with this trick, we can show that the sample complexity will be about the same as um, the previous slide. And also so far, we focused on the discounted MDP setting. For average reward MDP setting, we can also uh, apply the policy mill descent method. Okay, so basically in this setting, your value function is going to be the average of the cost function. And um, as your t goes to infinity. So for this class of problems, there are no complexity result has been reported for, reported for gradient type algorithm. And we show that the PMD method can be applied to this average reward MDP, and it will have sublinear convergence rate for both uni chain and some mixing assumptions. And it also achieved linear convergence for strongly convex regularized problems. Um, and we can design a CDT type algorithm and show that we can have similar sample complexity to discount, uh, discounted MTP setting. Okay. So there is of, there's also some um, other development in, from my group around policy mirror descent method. Uh, one interesting one is uh, the block of policy mirror descent. Because right now, if you know your state space is very large, then the policy mirror descent method requires to swap all the states. So in the block coordinate descent method um, in organization, we only need to update one block of variables. So what if we apply that idea to uh, reinforce learning setting? So indeed there was some difficulty for this idea in IR, but we managed to make it work. And we show that by randomly selecting one state or one block of state at each iteration, we can still have linear convergence and all the optimal sample complexity. And we also identified in some cases, this randomized algorithm may outperform uh, a deterministic uh, like PMD method. So, so with that, I, uh, I'm going to conclude my talk and I'm going to give a brief summary for what we have talked about. So, we gave uh, some background information about the Markov decision process and reinforced learning. And we reviewed a few existing algorithms in the IR setting corresponding to linear programming, binary iteration, and policy iteration in MDP. So we focused on policy mirror descent method. By utilizing the generalized monotonicity, we show that this algorithm has a linear convergence for uh, solving deterministic problems. And we have a um, uh, significantly better sample complexity for both generating model and the Markovian model than existing policy gradient methods. And some complex results, like this over this one over epsilon type uh, complex point, <coughs> have not been reported by, by anyone in the literature. <coughs> and we also talk about some. Further developments, such as the average reward and the coordinate descent type algorithm. And the message that I want to pass is by looking the problem, reinforced learning problem, MDP problem, from nonlinear or numerical organization perspective. We can have um, we can we can have a lot of more tools and much better. <coughs> um, um, performance guarantees for solving these challenging problems. So with that, I, want, I, I would like to uh, conclude my talk. And uh, this is a uh, list of the references. And the main one is, one of, is, is this one. And there are a few other related ones. Um, those are all available from archive. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.